Hello, good morning, good evening to everybody who has joined us today. Uh, I'm very, very happy to, to welcome you on this occasion. My name is Anelena Gonzalez from the Center for Mexican Studies of the National Autonomous University of Mexico um, with its office at uh, King's College London. And it is a great joy for me to, to be present here with um, uh, Dr. Vinicius de, de Carvalho, the director of the Brazil Institute, and with Dr. Berenice Ortega Bayona, who has been a, a, a fantastic um, a colleague in order to create uh, connections with uh, Latin American studies uh, between Mexico and the UK. Welcome, everybody. And uh, right now, over to you, Vinicius. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. I would request if they could turn on my video. Okay, yep, there we are. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vinicius de Carvalho. Um, as Anna said, I am director of King's Brazil Institute at King's College London, Vice Dean International in the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy. Um, this event today is the culmination of a great partnership that we have been establishing uh, in the last two, three years with the Center for Mexican Studies of UNAM here at King's College London. A great and, as I said, um, very productive partnership for which we had the pleasure and honor to have also the, the presence of uh, Dr. Berenice Ortega. Uh, as a as visiting professor with us during this academic year, um, and also with the Colegio de Estudios Latinoamericanos de la UNAM, uh, that we put together these reflexiones, uh, transatlantic reflections, rethinking Latin American today. We have hosted a, a series of lectures and conversations last year with scholars from King's doing is a virtual collaboration with UNAM. And this year we are having the same thing coming from, from UNAM, talking to us together in this in these panels. And for the last of these events uh, this year, we, we are having exactly the presence of uh, Dr. Berenice Ortega Bayona uh, as a conferencist. She will be talking about Gramsci and the nation, national popular Latin Americanist approach. Um, well, I will be not reading uh, Dr. Berenice, or allows me to call you Berenice, simply uh, CV here. We can find that in the internet. What I think it's important to mention is uh, we talk a lot on partnerships and collaborations between institutions and universities. You know all about this partnership between UNAN and King's College London. And we that are in this in this field and this environment, we have noticed that these partnerships they don't exist without people doing things, without engagement of colleagues, students, and staff, provoking, promoting, creating, and coming with ideas and executing these ideas. Um, Berenice has been one of those people that uh, activate that put the, put the finger and make things happen in these partnerships between. Uh, Kings and, and UNAM. And that's why I say that I'm very proud of having her here. And I'm very proud enough moderating her talk. And most importantly, spending this time now learning with her, as has been for me as a colleague and collaborator in this entire year of collaboration. It's in this process of constantly learning with her, with her inputs, and bringing to us in Kings some aspects that are fundamental for our mission today. One of them is a perspective of um, uh, Latin American in what is Latin American studies, not simply looking at Latin American as an object of study, but as a place from where it also come original scholarship, criticizing, questioning, and contributing to a global North debates. Uh, and that is a quite decolonial perspective in our point of view. And the second one, it's also um, the, this aspect of, of a feminist approach to, to what we are doing in our studies today. Uh, and I think those two elements are quite present in the work of Perenisi. And as I said, I've been learning a lot with her 
in this entire year. And I will not make longer my introduction here. I just would invite her to start her presentation. We will have uh, um, some minutes of her presentation and after space for questions in, and, and uh, comments. I would like to ask our audience, if you feel comfortable to turn on your cameras, will be great. And especially when we come to the discussions, would be great to see you uh, if possible, of course. And also remind you to keep your mics off so we will not have disturbances in the in the presentation here. Thank you so much again for your attendance here. And thanks very much again, uh, Anna Elena, for putting together this collaboration and Berenice for activating it and make it possible. The screen is your Berenice. Thank you very much, Vinicius. It's truly an, an honor um, to be here today, to be collaborating, to continuing continue this collaboration between our institutions, but also like you were mentioning between people, between colleagues, specific people and colleagues, because our institutions are very plural, <laughs> enormous, enormous bureaucratic monsters sometimes that we have to be um, battling against many times, but they also enable us the infrastructure to be able to build these collaborations and to make them happen. So. Um, I'm very thankful in that sense uh, to be hosted by uh, King's College and um, to count on the, the aid and the collaboration of UNAM UK. Um, so for my presentation today, uh, I wanted to, I kept thinking about how to, um, who to aim it towards, because I think that's something that we've been reflecting on a lot uh, during these collaborated um, conferences. Who is our audience? Who are we talking to? Um, so I, I pitched it at a very general um, uh, audience, considering that we might have colleagues, students from different levels and from both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, so I hope it doesn't wind up being too general, but um, I'll try to keep it more or less short so that if uh, anybody from the audience or my colleagues want to want me to elaborate on something more specifically, then we, we should still have time to do so um, in the end. I also took an approach of, um, I've, I've, I'm going to use a lot of images to um, reflect and to illustrate many of the points I'm, I'm making. And so in that sense, like I said, I hope it doesn't come across as, as too broad or too general, but um, rather than uh, making it a presentation that becomes so dense in uh, theoretical frameworks and, and concepts that perhaps would be more appropriate for a class. You know, uh, I wanted to, to make this a bit uh, friendlier and uh, more in the tone of a conversation. So I will begin by uh, sharing a presentation with you. Give me a second. Everybody can see the presentation? Okay, good. So um, today, indeed, I will be presenting on the topic of Ramsey and the National Popular from a Latin Americanist approach. And by Latin Americanist approach, I'm mostly referring to colleagues who have preceded me in a political theory and social theory discussion on Gramsci's work. Um, I am indeed standing on the shoulder of giants when uh, I talk about this topic because uh, colleagues before me and at present have uh, studied Gramsci's work in, in much, much depth. As I will mention in, in a bit, um, we are very proud in, in, in Mexico, in Argentina, in Brazil to have translations of the entire work of, of Gramsci, you know, translations into Spanish that in fact were more available or were available sooner than they were in English for some texts. So um, we are not short in theorists uh, and connoisseurs on, on Gramsci's work. Um, but I wanted to, when, when thinking about what to share with you today and what to talk about with you today, um, I, I have been 
I mean, this is linked to my own research because I have been working on uh, uh, a translation of, of Bramsky's work recently. But um, I thought I would emphasize the, the chat on the concept of the national popular. And this is because of the context that we live in, and we've been living in the past decade or more in, in our region. Um, the way that, that the media covers many of the political transformations and political governments in Latin America and the way that they are studied um, has, has given a revival to the concept of populism. But rather than get into complications about that concept, which is indeed a very broad and, and, and many times frustratingly ambiguous concept, um, I would like to step back a bit and maybe review where that concept, I believe, also came from. And what that, con when, when we think about populism in Latin America, many times we are linking it to another theoretical debate and tradition, which has to do with the concept of the national populism. So I will explain a bit why to me they're not the same thing um, and why I'm focusing on the first rather than the latter. Um, but like I said, I'm going to try and make this uh, very friendly and not uh, not get into many um, thorny conceptual and dense debates about it. Um, so to begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the two images on the screen. Uh, these are prints by the same artist, whom I will talk about in a second. Uh, obviously, one of them is a reproduction of, of Gramsci's portrait, and another is what I, an image that I feel uh, graphically represents uh, very accurately what the national popular uh, means uh, when we think about it as a practice, as a historical reference, and in, in theory um, from Latin America. So the artist who um, drew both those, who created both those images, is Leopoldo Mendes. And just as a, as a way to introduce the, the presentation, um, let me uh, talk a bit about his work. He is considered one of the main um, graphic artists of the beginning of the 20th century in Mexico. And uh, he is pretty much as close as you can get to the definition of a militant artist. Um, he was a member of, of the Communist Party but then uh, more than, than an engaged uh, communist, he uh, became very engaged with um, uh, peasant organizations, worker and union organizations. And uh, he was one of the founders of the Taller de Grafica Popular or the um, workshop or popular graphics, which had the main and almost sole objective of um, creating prints for the dissemination of uh, these organizations, these peasant and worker organizations. Um, and in a way to also um, spread and talk about um, more about the post-revolutionary uh, regime. You know? as, as many of you might be aware, there was a, a big social revolution in Mexico at the beginning of the 20th century. And Leopoldo Mendes's work um, portrayed uh, all of these popular sectors that participated in that revolution and who then continued to participate in what was known to be the post-revolutionary government. And um, like I was saying, this workshop, this popular graphics workshop, uh, always set its main priority as being at the service of the needs of these popular sectors. So not, not, not really the needs of the post-revolutionary government, but the post-revolutionary ideal within these popular sector organizations, union, peasant organizations. So here, for example, we see one of his prints um, uh, depicting a, what he called a spontaneous uh, rally, and this other one um, depicting one of the rebellions in the context of the revolution. Um, here up above, we see one of his uh, most famous uh, prints of Emiliano Zapata. Many of you might know one of the 
peasant leaders of the Mexican Revolution, and um, not coincidentally, a print on Gramsci himself. So this is this is why I thought it was it was it would be a very um, appropriate introduction to the chat because we can find many links between Leopoldo Mendes's work and Gramsci's work. Um, like Gramsci, uh, Leopoldo Mendes tried to um, reflect, incorporate the emotions and the suffering of popular sectors in his in his work. And uh, for Gramsci, you know, um, the incorporation of the subaltern sectors, uh, peasant and worker. Um, sectors into um, the priorities of the Italian Socialist Party, uh, Communist Party, sorry, and um, what he was aiming to construct, you know, in, in Italy as a more democratic and eventually socialist government. Um, this was part of Gransky's political ideals, but his political ideals were very, very much linked to a biography of coming from uh, um, a peasant sector himself, you know, in the margins of Italy. Um, Italian wasn't even his first language. You know, he came from a region called Sardinia. And um, in principle, his, his main objective was to try to incorporate the cultural into political thought. Um, I'll get into that more in a bit. But so, Thinking about these links between uh, Leopoldo Mendes' work and Gramsci, you know, I was uh, it, it came about because I was thinking, well, why why was Gramsci a character of interest for Leopoldo Mendes um, when he did this uh, print? It's 1942. Um, it's also the international context and part of a big anti-fascist movement that was a transatlantic movement and uh, where many of the communist militants in Mexico participated you know, as part of this anti-fascist movement. So he was definitely familiarized with uh, Gramsci's um, work and how he had been imprisoned and died in prison. And so um, he was he was already at this point, in 1942, already Gramsci was uh, uh, a symbol you know, of anti-fascism, of the anti-fascist struggles. Now, Another one of the main links that, that I made with his work and why, and, and well, the focus that I'm going to give to this uh, presentation today is the aspect of, of translation, interpretation, and appropriation in both Mendes's work and in Brown's work. Um, both of them, as I was saying, tried to uh, incorporate the, the, the priorities, the demands, the, the suffering of popular sectors, but to do so, they had to function as mediators and as translators, literally as translators, you know, from different languages, in, in indigenous languages in, in Mexico's case. And um, Gramsci trained in the first instance as a linguist, and that's what he did for a living for many years, translate. Um, and then came another stage of interpretation. You know? So, uh, for instance, in this uh, Leopoldo Mendes print, um, he, is, he is not only translating these, these in his uh, interpretation you know, through his art, what he feels is, um, is at the root of many of these indigenous peoples, their culture and their traditions and the symbolism surrounding that. Uh, but also, like I think, these long-standing sufferings and deprivations and marginalizations that they have suffered. Um, and so in that is not only an exercise of, of translation, but also an exercise of interpretation. Um, as a political theorist, Gramsci did this as well, um, incorporating elements, obviously, from his own biography, like I was saying, uh, a very um, poor... Um, upbringing in, in the countryside, in the margins of uh, Italy, very separated and um, distant from that industrial uh, Italian north. You know? um, one of his main concerns is going to be thinking about the traditions and uh, the cultural aspects that influence the political. 
And he is obviously thinking about uh, popular sectors from the part of Italy that he comes from and how they have integrated or not into this industrialization in the 20th century with the rest of Italy, how they can uh, assume they are part of the national state of Italy or not, uh, why they could feel alienated from uh, what was conceived as the national, the modern uh, Italian nation state. And, and so it's not a coincidence then that he will be placing such an emphasis on understanding the traditions and cultural aspects of popular sectors, not just their political thought, not just how to build modern socialist political parties just out of political ideal, but why um, traditions and religion, for instance, uh, folk, po popular culture, you know, are, are aspects that we need to understand if we want to truly engage with uh, popular sectors and working classes. So um, as, well, I, I'm not going to go in too much into Gramsci's biography, but as most of you might know, he, he is imprisoned by the Mussolini government and he will die in, in prison. Um, but throughout his short life, he'll be um, developing what he was aiming to be a, a, a body of political thought, a series of concepts. And, um, unfortunately, because of his premature death, many of those concepts can be found, or most of those concepts can be found in uh, what are known as the notebooks, the, 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 his prison notebooks, and letters that he would write to um, his relatives, mostly his wife and his sister-in-law, um, and colleagues from the uh, Communist Party. Um, but they are presented in a very unstructured way because he hadn't finished them. You know, those those were all his literally his notebooks, and uh, he says it himself in his notebooks. These are unfinished ideas. This is a work in progress. When I get out, I will finish it. You know? And so, we we what we have today are uh, just over thirty notebooks um, with unstructured um, thought, but very rich and developed thought uh, from Gramsci. So. The translation of his work and the interpretation of his work uh, has is is plays a big part in um, what we understand from Gramsci. Mm -hmm. the, the, the translation, especially, is key um, because it was it has been done in in some languages, uh, but the translation itself of his work has taken many years and um, has been a whole process in itself and part of political projects, political intellectual projects in themselves. Um, Latin America, as I was saying at the beginning, has not been uh, distant from this. Um, Dora Canusi, for example, uh, she has played a major role in translating all of um, Gramsci's work, the notebooks, the letters, um, and many of his um, early writings uh, into Spanish and publishing them in, in Mexico. But also she has um, played a big part in, uh, especially throughout the 90s, she played a very big role in getting intellectuals and experts together to talk about Gramsci's work. So beyond the translation and the interpretation phase now, an appropriation of it to apply his concepts to a Latin American context and to debate the political processes in Latin America from uh, Gramsci's concepts. Um, so in that sense, we, like I was saying, I, I, I owe a lot of um, respect to those who have preceded me, um, who read Gramsci in Italian and then in, in Spanish and um, in, in Portuguese as well, you know, and who have um, elaborated political thought, very sophisticated political thought using uh, Gramsci's work. So we are not sure in Latin America of many publications um, that talk about or that use Gramsci's concepts to analyze um, political processes. 
Nonetheless, I feel that because the debate uh, over the, from the second half of the 20th century to, to date is, is so rich and developed in, in our region, and Gramsci has been so influential in political thought and discussions in our region, that sometimes it's been hard to find as a, as a teacher and as a professor of undergraduate students, um, sometimes I've struggled in finding texts that are at an introductory level to Gramsci's work. Most of the work published in, in Spanish, at least that you can find in Mexico, um, are these interpretations and, and analyses that require the reader to already be familiarized with Gramsci's concepts, who already have read some of Gramsci's work and digested and uh, structured Gramsci's concepts. So for undergraduate students, um, sometimes it's been it's been difficult to point pinpoint a specific text that can aid them or that can accompany them to understanding Gramsci's work. So this is where I'm going to open a very brief parenthesis, um, but just uh, to mention what I've been doing in the past months. Um, precisely, I've been translating a, uh, a book by Roger Simon. He is, or he was, an uh, uh, important theorist um, of the 60s and 70s in Britain, um, who is, is responsible for most of the publications of Gramsci's work in Britain because he was uh, part of the editorial board of Lawrence and Wishart. Um, the, uh, this is the publishing um, uh, organization that uh, was in charge basically of um, publishing all of the um, materials for the Communist Party in Britain. And uh, so they own the rights to English translations to Marx's work, Gramsci's work, and many other um, uh, socialist thinkers in, uh, in Britain. Um, Simon not only was uh, somebody that uh, was very committed to um, disseminating Gramsci's work in Britain, but he uh, also played a big part in translating some of his work. And he also founded the Labor Research Department, um, which is a trade union think tank for the labor movement, basically. And one of his main um, um, jobs throughout his life was to be a teacher there and to teach Gramsci to the workers in the unions and different unions throughout Great Britain. So this, the, the book that I've been translating, that fortunately I've finished translating, it's not a very long book, it's a pretty short book actually. Um, Gramsci's Political Thought and Introduction was, he wrote it specifically for that purpose, to make Gramsci's political thought accessible to workers in Britain, to uh, form part of the unions main uh, didactic materials you know? and uh, the book focuses on Gramsci's political concepts because obviously um, he's linking it to um, his role as a militant and um, the union work the workers role in social change in Britain you know what, what was aspired to be um, a socialist change or at least a more democratic change in British society. So um, that is what I've been working on. And I've also been working on an introductory study uh, linking British Gramscians to Latin American Gramscians. So that's just a brief parenthesis. To have many of the British um, Gramscians that I've been looking at are um, captured in Roger Simon's book. He, um, in, a, in a very synthetic but clear uh, way, he incorporates the different interpretations that British Marxists had of Gramsci. Um, for instance, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, Perry Anderson, uh, from a more, I, I may be um, committing some um, generalizations here, but from a more Leninist reading of Gramsci. And then E.P. Thompson, Stuart Hall, a more culturalist reading of Gramsci. That's in very broad terms, obviously. And then I've also placed here Chantal Mouf, although she's Belgian, most of her intellectual uh, life and, and work has been um, 
developed here in Britain, and she was definitely, or she has definitely been part of this discussion, Gramscian discussion in Britain in the last decades. Um, so after that parenthesis, <laughs> we will, I can start talking to you a bit more uh, in detail about what the national popular uh, was for Gramsci. Now, please excuse the, the very um, big PowerPoint here with all the, the text. Um, I'll try to explain it as uh, synthetically as I can. Um, first of all, just to um, set the, the record straight, national popular is not the same as populism. So national popular refers to a political project and a political project specifically set in the 20th century. Uh, whilst populism is, we, we can characterize it more as a style of government. And as I was saying earlier, there's a lot of debate around um, what, how we can define with more precision what that style of government is, so I'd rather not get into that um, discussion. Um, but I do want to link why the national, why to understand if we are ever going to engage in a very, in a more serious and inclusive debate about populism, we need to include the concept of national popular and what that concept has meant historically in Latin America. Um, and why it's so important to, to, to understand um, what we categorize or what different theorists around the world categorize as populist government. So um, when we look at the concept of, of popular, I am situating it, because Gramsci situated it specifically in the 20th century, you know, in the context of the 20th century. Um, in this sense, it, it, his interpretation and his definition of it is from that perspective, from the 20th century context that he was living. Um, so one of the main questions that he asks himself when he thought about the national popular was, he asked himself, how had fascism appropriated the national popular in Italy? Because as you may know, Mussolini's um, fascism was sustained by popular and working class sectors as well. So um, it would be, too romanticized to think that popular sectors uh, are naturally left wing or, or socialist. No? Um, one of the main preoccupations of Gramsci was precisely how it was that um, popular sectors could be manipulated or could be um, incorporated into uh, a more fascist, in, in that case, or authoritarian political project. Um, and obviously all of this, I'm sure, you know, is, is ringing some bells with contemporary context in the US, in, in, in Britain, you know, all, all around Europe as well. So um, what he was thinking about then is not alien to us now. Um, so for him, the main problem was that um, when he thought about Italian nationalism, especially these nationalisms, uh, developed throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. These nationalisms generally did not include popular sectors, did not include these vast majorities of working class people's peasant sectors. Um, so the notion of national identities was shaped around um, elites, upper class, uh, aristocratic in many cases, in the Italian case certainly, aristocratic elites um, that were not, that did not uh, empathize, that did not understand uh, the ways of popular sectors. And that's why for Gransky, it was very important to under, to say, well, as part of this popular sector, we have to understand what we're, we're not backwards, we're not antiquated, we're not anti-modern. Mm -hmm. um, if, we, if we begin with those prejudices, then we're never going to understand the majorities and how are we ever going to build a hegemonic or a legitimized political project on that basis. So for him, Italian nationalism um, could be manipulated into a fascist project because to start with, the nationalist project had not incorporated popular sectors. So, um, for him, uh, it was important in order to build 
a more le legitimate and democratic um, nationalist identity, it would have to incorporate this collective will that he takes from, from Machiavelli's work. Um, Gronsky was a, a big reader of Machiavelli, and um, he, he talks about the his, he recovers the historical dimension that, that Machiavelli um, constructs this concept around, but he emphasizes, he incorporates and emphasizes the culture as well. Um, obviously for him, this new myth that Mac Machiavelli talks about, which is the prince, no? For, for Gramsci, the prince is going to be a, a socialist Italy no? and, and a new popular uh, myth that would be a national identity that would be more authentic because it would incorporate all these popular sectors and um, their demands and their needs and, and uh, their multiple forms of identity. Um, for this to happen, in, in order for this to happen, this, the national popular is going to be very linked to other key concepts in, in Gramsci, such as uh, the role that intellectuals have in social transformation, um, hegemony, historical block. No? Um, why, why are the intellectuals key in this? Because the intellectuals would serve as mediators to contribute um, and, and to contribute shaping what he calls the moral dimension or the common sense um, in the political project. So intellectuals would be kind of the bridge between popular sectors and uh, different classes that occupy um, places of power in government um, and would be key in construct um, So these interclass alliances would have to be legitimized by a political project uh, that is shaped by the majority. Um, so not alliances built alien to the majority, but that would incorporate their needs. Um, and their identity. And this is how you would legitimize these political projects and hence build a hegemon. Um, so I'm going to, like I said, if, if there's more questions, I can I can go into this in, in more depth in a bit, but um, I don't want to bore you with <laughs> more and more um, about Gramsci's um, concepts. Um, I would like to now talk about how his concept of the national popular materialized in the historical experience of Latin America in the 20th uh, century, especially in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and so for Latin America, it was not exactly a, a socialist reality, not in the most, for the most part. I mean, we do have some exceptions, but for the most part, when we talk about the national popular as a historical experience, the examples that I, I will in a bit use to illustrate this um, aren't necessarily linked to socialism. Um, but uh, they do have some general characteristics that we can uh, find in all of them. Uh, for instance, um, they all these national popular projects were very keen on universal access to education and political rights for all sectors. Um, we're particularly thinking about indigenous peoples, um, indigenous peoples that didn't acquire the right to vote or to be, to be represented or to represent themselves um, till in many cases, um, the latter half of the 20th century. Um, so this is a, a constant claim um, throughout the first decades of the, of the 20th century to um, give access, or to achieve access of political rights for indigenous people. And uh, for this, education was necessary. Why were both of these linked? Because in, in most cases, the right to vote was linked to knowing Spanish, being literate. So if you did not speak and write Spanish, you did not have the right to vote. Um, so for during the colonial period and the 18th and some of the 19th century, many of the indigenous struggles were focused on recovering lands that had been um, stolen, um, the lack of uh, autonomy that, um, that they uh, were deprived from, 
during um, liberal reformations during, during the 19th century. Um, but at the, uh, from the 20th century, one of their main demands is going to be universal access to education because they realized that knowing Spanish was a key element to political participation and to also know the law that they were being victimized by so that they could then fight in the legal courts to recover the lands that had been stolen away from them. Um, so this is going to be a big part of the national popular project. Uh, also land reform mm -hmm. to incorporate uh, the needs of, and the demands of peasant sectors, uh, i.e. indigenous peoples that had been um, deprived from their lands uh, for overall the 18th and 19th centuries. In fact, more land was stolen from indigenous peoples uh, after the colonial period, so during the 18th and 19th centuries, than during the whole of the colonial period. So um, this is going to be another important aspect uh, that national popular projects will take on board. Uh, labor and social rights through unions and popular sector organizations. Obviously, this is uh, in relation to the context of capitalism, the development of capitalism and industrialization in Latin America in the 20th century. Um, new political parties based on the integration of popular sectors and um, uh, multi-class multi -class alliances, um, such as APRA in Peru, the PRI in Mexico, and uh, Unidad Popular in Chile, the MNR in Bolivia. Um, these are all going to be parties that are going to be created in the 20th century. So they are not uh, these 19th century classic um, elite-based parties, liberals and conservatives. These are going to be new parties that are, that are going to be incorporated by popular sectors and unions, especially in present organizations. Um, and another characteristic of these parties is that they will incorporate a Latin Americanist discourse uh, of like a big Latin Americanist alliance to uh, resist, to oppose U.S. imperialism, basically. Um, what something that will be key, you know, recovering uh, what Gramsci talked about. Uh, when he referred to the role of intellectuals, um, who would be the mediators uh, to negotiate mechanisms uh, between classes for development and industrialization, uh, which would be fundamental to achieve hegemony in our country in the 20th century. Mainly, it would be um, teachers, union leaders, um, uh, some political activists, but uh, um, I'm going to talk about this in a, in a second. Um, teachers, for example, would be uh, the classic um, symbol of the mediator between the state and popular sector um, and, and union. Um, like I was saying, these, these projects, national popular projects, were also part of um, a, a, a movement, a general, a regional movement of liberation and that sought liberation and sovereignty uh, from the, the weight that uh, the U.S. placed on uh, on our countries you know, uh, because of their foreign uh, policy priorities you know, and very direct interventions, as, as you are probably all familiar with. Um, so these were all movements that incorporated that aspect into their um, uh, manifestos and priorities. Um, as I was saying, Latin, they promoted Latin American regional alliances. And uh, one of the key uh, instruments to achieve further sovereignty and strengthen their positions um, when confronting the US uh, would be the nationalization of strategic industries, such as the oil industry, um, mining, um, and uh, for Caribbean countries, nationalizing some of their um, agro export industries, such as the exportation of sugar, tobacco. Um, were they anti-liberal? Were they social democratic? Were they always linked to socialism? Not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm really placing them all in, in a big bag, but um, 
if we, my, my historian colleagues would be very upset with me, you know, um, if we look at each experience um, in particular, we will find nuances and differences <clears throat> that obviously prevent us from making these generalizations. You know? So I, I won't go as far as placing a political ideology staple to the national popular category because there was a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, there were even, I would call some authoritarian and even military national popular projects. No, so it was all a, a bit um, too plural to, to universalize and generalize. But we could say in general that many of them that survive, uh, because some of them were cut short very too soon because of US intervention, um, some of them who did prolong uh, throughout the years did eventually become very corporatist, bureaucratic and, and authoritarian projects as well. So just to illustrate some of these examples, um, I was talking about APRA, the, the Alianza Popular Revolucionaria Americana in Peru. Um, this is an example worth mentioning because uh, today it's one of the most uh, well, it's the longest lived party in the region. Um, it was created in the 20s and it still survives um, today. Um, they had had very failed experiences of government, um, but they're worth mentioning because of their longevity and because originally in their manifesto, they did talk about this big uh, regional alliance uh, to. to to um, countervene US imperialism. Um, obviously, one of the examples that many of us might be familiar with is Lázaro Cárdenas' uh, presidency in Mexico because um, he would set an example of how uh, to incorporate popular sectors into the new post-revolutionary party, the PRI, and to legitimize it and not just make it a revolution from the top bottom, but to actually democratize that party and the post-revolutionary project. Um, he conducted large projects of land reform and, and union, uh, legitimizing and uh, unions. And one of his main and symbolic um, achievements was the national, has been the nationalization of the oil industry. This is an old um, Mexican bill that's not circulating anymore, but um, I just use it to illustrate how symbolic this nationalism is in the national identity of Mexico. Um, this is considered like one of the main conquests of the 20th century and one of those moments where Mexico uh, was able to stand its own ground uh, in relation to US and, and, and British oil companies. You know? um, there are lots of um, anecdotes about how, because we, they had the, the government paid indemnization to these companies. Um, there are lots of anecdotes about how people lined up, queued up to donate their chickens, their wedding rings, to contribute to the uh, payment uh, to indemnize these um, foreign companies, these foreign oil companies. So I, I'm just emphasizing this, not to romanticize it, but to emphasize how symbolic um, the national popular is as well. Like it's got that dimension too. Um, this is a this is a picture from I, I found it I found it very interesting because it's from Life magazine. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Life Time magazine is a very conservative magazine in the U.S. And this is a picture that um, they published back in the '30s um, to as part of an article that precisely warned against uh, what could potentially happen if Arbenz's government in uh, Guatemala was allowed to continue. And in fact, it was not allowed to continue. The US intervened in a very direct way to um, uh, organize a coup de d'etat and, and get Arbenz to um, resign. Why? Not because he was a socialist, not because he was, he was communist, but because he led a very profound or tried to lead a very profound um, land reform. And what is interesting about this uh, sign it, it not only alludes to the president and says he has fulfilled his promise, but it also says, campesino, peasant, here is your land, defend it, take care of it, and cultivate it. And that is something that I remember hearing in, in the testimonies that I've read from um, 
Mexican peasants too when they talked about uh, why they um, supported the Cardenas government. They said that he not only conducted land reform, but he gave us the weapons to defend those lands. So the national popular, you know, is not, it does have a symbolic and a discursive element to it, but it also had a very material element to it um, that involved revolutionary processes, some more radical than others, as, as we will see. Um, in Bolivia, there was in the end of revolution in 1952, um, that for the first time gave the right to vote to indigenous people. And uh, it was an interesting revolution because the popular sectors that participated in it involved indigenous peoples who were by then also minors. You know? So it was like a, a blending of uh, a more 20th century worker identity blended with a uh, whole um, uh, historical indigenous background and, and uh, tradition of struggle as well. Um, also, one of the uh, more emblematic examples is Unidad Popular of the party um, in Chile that was created by the union of uh, various um, left-wing organizations and smaller parties, you know, and who um, Salvador Allende led to power eventually in um, in 1971. I mean, the party was created in 1969, but I'm pretty sure they won in 1971. Um, and that was, as most of you must know, um, they, they got overthrown by a military coup financed by the US um, in 1973. Uh, the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua you know, is another classic example um, in the early 70s, uh, late 70s rather. Um, and also, and obviously the Cuban, um, the Cuban Revolution too, but I, I'm not gonna um, talk about that example because I think it's, it's an example that uh, is known um, too much or has been talked about too much already. So let me um, now concentrate on the aspect of education, just, just to name one of the aspects that incorporates this notion of the national populism. The significance of education to legitimize the national popular was, as I was saying, the figure of the mediators and the teacher as the mediator. Um, the teacher who would generally come from peasant or indigenous communities, uh, rural or working class communities, um, and who would speak the language, so to say, of these popular sectors, and who would be the bridge to um, uh, institutionalize uh, their demands. Um, obviously, there's a big criticism towards many of these um, educational projects that then became integration products, uh, projects that tended to try to invisible sorry, invisibilize indigenous um, identity you know, and try to integrate them into a more um, mestizo or Spanish speaking identity and, and culture. You know? um, but in the, in the beginning, these two um, um, uh, pamphlets that I'm showing you here, um, also generated by the Taller de, de, de Grafica Popular, no? that I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation, they precisely emphasize you know, the link between education and the political. So as a student, you need to organize and you need to integrate or you need to organize as a popular party um, affiliate. And uh, here in the, this one to the right, this is a, um, a pamphlet for the CETEM at the, the National Workers' Confederation, talking about how part of their project and demand is a, a universal education project you know, that will have, that will give popular education to so not only access but uh, contents that will uh, incorporate the demands of popular sectors. Um, and so, this one in particular is already uh, manifesting its support to one of the um, presidents, later presidents of, of the Mexican post-revolutionary era, who in fact was very pro-US and pro-industrialization. So um, he, he would be the opposite of, of a socialist um, project. But, but 
in fact, he was still considered part of this national popular ideal. Um, so to, to close off, because I think um, I don't want to talk too much, and I'd like to give some more room to questions and the conversation with, with colleagues. Um, the national popular is not only about um, a historical experience in our region, but it's also about a theoretical debate. You know? it, it also has that dimension. You know? as, as I was saying earlier, uh, the translation of Gramsci's work uh, was part of a whole political project for many uh, theorists in our region. Um, first of all, uh, the clearest example would be um, the project created by Jose Arico, Juan Jose Portanteiro, and Hector Agosti in Argentina. Um, they founded a group called uh, Pasado y Presente, or Past and Present. Um, it's not a coincidence that that also matches with uh, the historian uh, left wing group or history from below group with British historians. Um, so their project was. Uh, part of, was by creating a journal, but it was also a publishing project where they um, they set out to translate many of not only Gramsci's work but many of the Marxist thinkers that were not available in Spanish at the, at the time. Um, thinkers from Russia, from Germany, uh, from different Eastern European countries, um, and and uh, one of their favorites you know, was Gramsci. Uh, they were militants of the Argentinian Communist Party, and and one of their main um, questions you know, as a, as a discussion group was uh, whether the national popular could eventually lead to a socialist project in Argentina or not. And in the late seventies, uh, as you might be familiar with, um, there were dicta military dictatorships in in Argentina, which forced uh, many of these. Uh, thinkers and activists into exile. Uh, so this whole group, as, as a group, exiled to Mexico and then refounded their um, publishing project in Mexico. So uh, the publishing company Siglo XXI, a very prominent uh, editorial and, and publishing project, a, a contemporary um, pub <coughs> sorry, publishing house, began with, uh, because of the initiative of uh, many of these political thinkers in exile, in, in Mexico, um, I mean, this publishing um, house doesn't only publish materials um, on socialism, it produces many more uh, topics, but it, it did start out with that um, uh, objective. They, they even had a whole collection called uh, the, the Library of Socialist Thought. Um, then uh, eventually, after the dictatorships, many of them did move back uh, to Argentina and did continue being playing a part in, in, in the political debate. You know? And uh, one of them, who I guess would be a generation younger than them, but that did interact with them and did share some of these discussion spaces with them, is Ernesto Laclau. Um, so, like I said, he's a bit younger than them, but he was part of these debates. He's he's Argentinian as well, and and one of his categories. And, and one of the categories that he would go on to develop in his uh, political theory would be precisely populism. And he would have a more, so to say, postmodernist or discursive interpretation of Gramsci's work that has been, well, that he coined as post Marxism. And that has been very debated, criticized, and discussed to date, but um, he, he developed this whole political theory with his wife, Chantal Mouf, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, she still lives, uh, that's how it's passed away already, but she still lives, and she still goes around giving conferences all, all around the world um, about their, their theory. Um, so there were, to, to, to say there was a unified interpretation of Gramsci in Latin America would be a mistake, because even within this group, there were nuances and there were differences in their um, their interpretations and um, in their um, um, discussion, um, in their arguments. But for for um, this presentation's sake, you know, um, 
I think it's important to not forget that these debates existed before um, this whole contemporary debate on populism. Um, another one of the important uh, thinkers that um, I believe is is crucial um, and was very has been very influential in Latin American political thought is René Zavaleta. He is Bolivian. Um, he was a journalist and political theorist. He was a militant of the MNR and and are at the time of the um, revolution in Bolivia, and he was then part of the first revolutionary government. Then he was also forced into exile after that revolution uh, wound up in military uh, interrupted by military coups. Um, he spent many years in exile in, in Europe, but then mostly in Mexico. Um, and his concerns uh, revolved around the possibilities and failures precisely of revolutionary processes. You know? Having Bolivia as his main reference, he, he asked himself, you know, why did that revolution fail? Um, what, what can, how can we conceptualize uh, political change and transformation and the state uh, from a Latin American uh, reality? Um, and he was a, a fond reader of Gramsci and he, had a, a, he applied Gramsci's concepts uh, to his own uh, theoretical concepts, uh, particularly in, in the, the need he, he took from Gramsci, the, the need of an interclass alliance between workers' movements and, and the nationalist political party that would help guide the efforts of uh, political change and, and transformation. Um, so he, he was also a disciplinarian because he uh, took a lot on board from uh, history by saying, well, we, we have to develop political concepts and theory, but we cannot just be shaped in the abstract. We need to um, uh, have as a main reference the historical experiences and the historical experience from popular sectors to understand uh, political transformation and revolutionary processes in Latin America. Um, I think I'm going to draw this to a conclusion now because um, I, like I said, I would like to um, hear some uh, feedback or exchange um, from the public. Uh, but in general terms, this is uh, what I've been um, incorporating into my, uh, into my, um, into my recent research and, and translation um, project. And, and, and the research on Gramsci, you know, and, it, and it's just, uh, I guess I could just sum up saying that it's, it's been a very interesting experience to um, understand the plurality of um, interpretations of somebody's work, you know, that uh, when you read once, you might think it's very clear and, and that there's only one way of understanding it, but actually um, there are multiple ways, and there are multiple ways of understanding it because there are multiple things at stake when we interpret theory. So just like there was so much at stake for Gramsci when he was developing the theory, so too for all of these other uh, intellectuals um, and activists that I have mentioned, uh, the theory wasn't just part of uh, an intellectual exercise. What was at stake was the revolution. <laughs> what was at stake was whether um, there would be revolutionary change in our region or not. And this wasn't just uh, uh, something that they were thinking about um, in the abstract. They were thinking about this because throughout the decades in the 20th century, this is what they had been witnessing in the region. Popular sectors organizing to push for a more inclusive government, uh, governments that, and, and national projects that would include these historically marginalized sectors. Um, but once again, and, and, and Vinicius being Brazilian, one of the other big examples that's always set when talking about the national populace is, is Getulio Vargas' um, period. But again, to, to go, when we go into each one of these examples, we will find that there are many contradictions um, and, it, and that it's not so easy to sum up in one concept like nationalism and, and 
much less popular than now. But um, uh, nonetheless, I thought today it, I wanted to um, recuperate lots of these debates that, uh, that preceded us and that um, can still teach us a lot when uh, looking at political processes and social struggles and political struggles today in our region. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Berenice, for your presentation. <clears throat> and yeah, as always, I've, I'm learning a lot with with your your presentation today here. And I can see that you have had a quite productive time with us um, in this period as well. Um, before I open for questions in the audience, I also want to, yeah, probably ask you some questions here or even uh, make some comments based on what you said that provoked me to think also on the context of Brazil and other contexts uh, related to Latin America as well. First, um, I just want to share with you, um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you see this thinking inside the box? So this is um this is an exhibition that we just opened a few days ago here in, in Kings. Um, it's based on political pamphlets and posters that are in the collection of Senate House Library. Um, and we have actually um, many of those posters and political pamphlets that are addressing many of the issues that you have been talking here on the historical context of, um, of Latin America. And I, I recommend everyone to check there because when you click here, you can actually have uh, 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 text done by students commenting on each one of those art. Um, and I am mentioned that because you start with, with uh, showing and the, asking about the question of how art can reflect that, especially this popular art. And then um, I, it's my first question that I would bring to you here, especially about this art that you start showing. Is, is that an art about the people or an art for the people or an art by the people? And I want to provoke the strict perceptions here because I think that changes a lot on how much these ideas, especially Gramsci ideas, could uh, were understood, translated, and interpreted, uh, as you mentioned here. Now, who, where is the people here? Is the people a target audience? Is the people an actor uh, in this process of transformation? How we locate people here? No. And then and other aspects that uh, you're in your presentation, I want to bring us as discussions. When you discuss about the teacher as a mediator, um, myself uh, totally influenced by Paulo Freire, pedagogy of oppressed, um, I can see quite a lot of similarities here. And of course, um, I, I don't know how much Freire was familiar with Gramsci writings, ideas for sure, yes, but not writings. and. Uh, especially considering that uh, the full translation of uh, Gramsci Cadernos uh, happened in the 20, 2000, sorry, in Brazil, only in the 2000, we had a, a full translation of the, the entire um, collection of the Cadernos um, by Gramsci. And so it would be interesting just to, to provoke if you can talk how much is this relation between Freire's pedagogy of oppressed and uh, Gramsci's views on the teacher as mediators. And finally, I would like to ask you to comment a little bit on the impact of Gramsci's thoughts, and if you consider that relevant or not, on movements like the theology of liberation that had such an impact, not only in the Catholic environment in Latin America, but also in the political context and in many of the, the, um, the movements that you mentioned in your talk today. So those would be my, my questions now. And also I am open to the audience. If you want to put your questions, please, you can either raise your hand and put the question or uh, simply type your questions in the in the chat and I will go there to, to check. Should I start then? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your. Um... Sorry, can you hear me? Um, thank you very much for your provocation. Um, yes, art for, by, and I would say the same for theory. Theory for, by. That's why I, I place such an emphasis on the translation 
and the interpretation aspect, because obviously, just like militants and militant artists are always struggling with being the figures of mediation, um, so are, are, I'm going to include myself, so are we as militant intellectuals. Um, are we speaking in the name of um, are we are we speaking? Are we taking somebody else's voice? No, this is I'm, this isn't anything new. This is this is a a question that anthropologists and ethnologists, sociologists, oral historians. I work from oral history. You know, oral historians have been posing themselves for decades. Um, what is the what we call the epistemic violence committed when um, we aspire to reflect the voice of the other, but in doing so, we also invisibilize the other? How much is it their voice? How much are we invisibilizing them? How, are, how much are we taking over them and, and, and committing a violence in this process? Um, but in, in, in the case of, uh, in these examples that I was setting uh, revolving around the national popular, I, I think you'd have to judge it case by case. No, it, it depends. I mean, there were, there were artists, there were theorists, uh, and there were presidents you know, that came from very humble background and that uh, precisely assumed this national popular project because it was a form of, of rebellion in a way, you know, of in conformity with uh, the elites occupying these positions of power and, and positions of power within the arts as well, if you want to include that. Um, so, so I think we, we have many examples of that. Lázaro Cárdenas himself you know, only had primary education when he became president. Um, he came from a military background. Um, but at the same time, uh, we had other, well, there were other examples of, of, of military uh, career officials that um, then became president, for example, in, in Villarreal in Bolivia, Arbenz in Guatemala, that came from a generation of, 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 of army officials that were very disappointed with the elites and their performance in government and how these elites had basically turned the countries over to foreign interests such as US foreign companies. So they, I would say that if we talk about it from, from you know, those who occupied power positions, many of them came from humble backgrounds and, and by nature had this anti-oligarchic, anti-elitist spirit, but also many of them maybe from not so humble backgrounds, but from a generation of, of army officials that, like I said, were very disappointed with how civilians from the elites had led their countries to wars, or you know, useless wars over borders or over resources, and and particularly this aspect of, of handing what they saw as handing over the country to foreign interests. So that's why it was so important to nationalize strategic industries for them. Um, I I believe Getulio Vargas would be would meet that profile as well. Peron, no, in, in Argentina, another bit, but again. I don't want to generalize because very complex characters, you know, very, uh, Peron's government was, was uh, friendly with fascism towards the end, you no, know? so there's lots of contradictions there. Um, I think figures like Roger Simon himself, this, this author that I've been translating, he came from a, a very privileged background in Britain. Um, uh, Part of the, as many of the histo communist historians, British communist historians were, you know, that went to elite universities, um, but that had aspects in their biography that made them be more empathetic and, and, and want to be closer to popular sectors and their voices. And, and I think in this action, of, in the case of Roger Simon, uh, turning away from academia, an academic career, a strictly university academic career, and instead founding an institute for unions, you know, for education and, and, and research for the at the service of the unions, I think is a political gesture you know, that 
um, aims towards uh, giving back the voice and power and empower people in these organizations to then be able to do the research themselves and express their needs and their um, and shape their political projects uh, themselves. I mean, not that they haven't been doing so historically, you know, but um, just to, 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 to share more tools to be able to do it. Um, in that sense, uh, the, the role of the teacher is, is also a very controversial and contradictory figure because uh, we can think of very, uh, very progressive examples of how teachers from their communities um, became these mediators to empower um, their communities and to not impose an integration and monolingual model, but in fact to develop bilingual education and to preserve indigenous identities and traditions. But at the same time, we've got you know, loads of examples of the mediator teacher who did not take that as a priority, who instead became the local version of a cacique, you know, uh, this like 18th, 19th century kind of land, well, not landlord, but some of them then did become uh, owners of properties and, and became just as authoritarian as, as, as their ancestors. So um, these, this figure of the mediator for the state and the institutionalization, the institution can go either, either way. It can, it can serve to empower, but I think in the majority of cases, um, that serve to oppress in fact no and um if we if we put that into a balance and i think this is one of the critical points that we can make of the national populism from the 21st century if we look back at the 20th century and and think in balance did national popular projects benefit popular sectors in the end if we look at the standing of popular sectors today it's it's not it's not a very easy question. I think many indigenous peoples would say the national popular did nothing for us. In the end, there are more um, monolingual indigenous people today than there were at the beginning of the 20th century. So bilingual education didn't work. Um, universal access to education didn't work. Just to to name an example, you no. Know? And if we then go into land ownership, access to resources. You know? But still, I think, you know, as you were seeing in some of the images, I, I wouldn't want to romanticize these, pro these, these processes, but, you know, these were revolutionary processes in many cases, like the Cuban revolution, or that we can't say they, they didn't have any beneficial impact in, in restructuring society and relations of domination either. So I think it's an open question and, a, and an important one to keep uh, reflecting on. Um, in that sense, uh, and, 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 and I think about the case of teachers because sometimes I have this discussion with my students. You know, I talk about uh, the, the, the importance that teachers had in unifying the country under a post-revolutionary national popular project and some of my students from more critical voices say teacher that that union that teacher's union was perverse no it, it just it, it, it aided in, in in violating people and in eliminating um cultural diversity you know and um submitting people to authoritarian practices to clientelism you know? so uh, I think there's plenty that we can criticize in the role of the mediator too. So just just to place some of the cautions that we need to have when thinking about these mediators. Um, now, the link with Freire, that's a very good uh, question. I, I, I don't know, I'm going to look that up because indeed, um, I think it would be very compatible with, with grants. Although purposely, I did not talk about the last set, uh, decades of the century where, where when theology of liberation had most of its impact in many rural 
um, and, and popular communities. I purposely did not include it because many of those uh, organization efforts um, were progressives, undoubtedly, were even linked to uh, Marxist revolutionary projects, but they did not, most of them did not consider, again, it's a case by case analysis, but the importance that they placed on the political party was not as clear as with France. I think, for instance, um, theorists of the subaltern school have um, incorporated Gramsci into their arguments by um, taking the emphasis that, that Gramsci puts on the cultural and, and how the cultural is political too. But I think the criticism that many Gramscians make of the subaltern school is, well, they didn't read Gramsci appropriately because they are forgetting that for Gramsci, this would only be, social change would only be possible if there was a political party to, to incorporate all these sectors as well. And, and that's, I believe, a more, I guess, Leninist reading of, of Gramsci. Gramsci was obviously in, in, a, in, a, in a conversation and, and, and Lenin was very influential in his thought too. Um, though Gramsci was a, a, had a critical position to Lenin's point of view too, but, but definitely the political party is present in Gramsci, definitely, and it's a key part of his thought. When we think about the 60s and onward, uh, we're thinking about a new left where many of these efforts are very critical to the, the path that communist parties have taken you know, in a more Stalinist route. And so many of them have distanced themselves from the political party and in general from the need of a political party or an alliance with a political party. And many of them, especially if we think towards the 80s, you know, 80s and 90s, we can see present more than the concept of national popular, we see the concept of autonomy. So autonomous efforts of political organization. And I, I, and I'm not an expert, but I, I have read some of Freda, and I believe he would be closer to the concept of autonomy than the concept of the national popular. The concept of the national popular is incorporating this discursive aspect that there is such a thing as this myth of the nation, you know, of a national identity. And, and I think for many of the activists of the second half of the 20th century, like I said, especially the latter decade, for them, this is a, this is a myth that's gone wrong. You know? uh, many of, by then, many of these national popular projects had gone sour um, and, and had, contributed as well, like I said, in many cases, to invisibilize those smaller voices or those differences, female voices, indigenous voices. You know? So what had proliferated was a very masculine and in a way authoritarian form of national, of the national populism. So um, I think uh, probably played in and, and many of the uh, communities that, that uh, adapted, adopted the theology of liberation um, projects would be very critical of the, the route that many of these national popular projects took. Having said that, though, in the 21st century, we saw that many of these movements, like the Movimento Sin Tierra in Brazil, did make alliances with political parties, again, like the the Partido de Trabajadores that, that led by Lula, no? Then they had a divorce again, but, but you can see um, political conjectures in which um, popular sectors and their organizations have made alliances with political parties still in the 21st century. But I'd say at the moment, the crises that political parties are going through in general make this aspect of Gramscian theory, very debatable. What, do we still need a political party? What kind of political party do we need for the 21st, for the needs of popular sectors in the 21st century? I, it can't be the same uh, masculine leadership 
and, and universal leadership that tends to uh, be anti-democratic to an extent, you know, that, that we tended to have in the 20th century. So that that is something that that is that merits much more debate today. Thank you very much, Berenice, for this first uh, comments on, on this, these questions that I brought here. I will deeply apologize, but I need to run to another meeting now. Um, I can see that we have more questions already here on the on the chat. Um, I, I would say goodbye here and leaving you with Anna Elena moderating these questions. And just want to again, thank you very much for this collaboration with us here at King's at Brazil Institute and all the colleagues that are attending and this, this um, event today. And uh, hopefully we will continue with that uh, in the near future, but I will not interrupt the flux of the debate here that's getting warm and good. Um, I will leave with Elena to continue and thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Vinicius. That's okay. Don't worry. So, um, thank you, Vinicius. Denise, um, thank you for, for a fantastic presentation. Very, very suggestive of so many things. And how, uh, especially from my, my perspective, I am keenly interested in, in the circulation of ideas. No? And uh, this is a, a unique example that uh, has led to the configuration of almost an entire continent, which I find fascinating. But um, tenemos muchas preguntas en español. I, uh, shall I read them in Spanish? Sí? Okay. So Isaac, Isaac Manuel Pérez Arroyo. Um, en la intención de integración, el proyecto nacional popular se puede pensar como un proyecto que busca un gobierno o un estado multicultural y agrega pensando en el contexto latinoamericano. Uh -huh. um, después viene una más larga. Eh, no sé si, si las juntamos o quieres responder esta inicialmente. No, la, la presidenta. La siguiente, ok. De Fabricio Emilio García Mejía. ¿De casualidad sabe cómo funciona la relación de los bloques contrahegemónicos con la religión en las distintas lecturas que hacemos de Gramsci en nuestra América, doctora? Es que en la revolución sandinista la religión tuvo un papel muy importante para la movilización. Me parece que lo mencionaron por ahí a través de la teología de la liberación, ¿no sería? Y también en el movimiento sin tierra de Brasil, que ha sido importante. Uh -huh. Um, as you wish, as you wish. Uh, so, since you've been speaking in English all the time, you may as well be more inspired to continue in, in English, even though the questions were in Spanish. I think we, we ought to stimulate both sides of our brain. So <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, so the questions, I I, I had already read this question in the chat, and I think they're, they're linked. So I'm going to try to answer both of them. Um, so in, integration in the national question, that's, that's a, like I said, that's one of the critical points when we look at the national question. Uh, so as precisely not to romanticize this question. Um, the whole objective in that context was to strengthen sovereignty. And that was something very important for Gramsci because it was very important for Machiavelli. And as I was uh, presenting earlier, Gramsci was a, a thorough reader of Machiavelli. And uh, in Machiavelli's context, Italy. Sorry, but in, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Your, your, your microphone is a bit. Sorry. Is that yeah. better? Okay. Sorry, but yeah, you I was saying um, Gramsci was a thorough reader of Machiavelli. And uh, for Machiavelli, strengthening the, the national popular was key if, they, if Italy was ever going to um, uh, be an independent nation uh, in relation to the British, uh, the, the French, um, the Prussian Empire, isn't it? Um, so, so that's why this aspect is so important for Machiavelli. And, and Gramsci, as a thorough reader of, of Machiavelli, takes this on board and, and says, yes, we need to reconfigure the national 
because many centuries after Machiavelli, when Gramsci's writing, he sees, yes, there is, now, now Italy is a nation state. We did manage that, but it, it, it has constructed its hegemony on an elitist nationalist identity, not an identity that incorporates popular sectors. And this vulnerates sovereignty as well, because if you do not incorporate these popular sectors into the national identity and into what, well, what he aligned with as a, as a progressist or a socialist nationalist uh, populist, then you're leaving the ground open for, or the doors open for uh, fascist right-wing projects or in our contemporary context, neoliberal projects to, to uh, construct an exclusive nationalist discourse. You know, like many of the examples that we see today in the US and in, in Europe as well, many of these uh, uh, Nazi nationalist um, organizations are, have also been marginalized economically in the last decades as a result of neoliberal um, economic reforms. So they, they have felt in a way abandoned by the left and with the destruction or the dismantling of unions, they are left uh, um, kind of um, helpless and, and, and uh, seeking new organizations to empower themselves. And so these nationalist anti-immigrant discourses, I'm talking about the current context, these nationalist uh, um, anti-elite, so they say, you know, although somebody like Trump you know, is a contradiction, <laughs> talking about anti-politics anti and um, uh, anti-political class when he comes from an elite too, but uh, an economic elite too. Um, but many of these working classes um, have been absorbed by these um, right-wing anti-immigrant um, nationalist organizations or discourses and have felt attracted to them because precisely they, they are marginalized economically and they feel marginalized politically by political parties that have eliticized you know, and that are very far from those working class parties at the beginning of the 20th century that Gramsci was talking about. So the political party that Gramsci was thinking about at the beginning of the 20th century has nothing to do with the political party elites that we see today. Um, so, sorry, I get lost in different ideas that I'm having. Um, so, why was integration important? Because it was part of strength, the strengthening of the state. And to strengthen the state in Grand Street, we needed to incorporate these popular sectors so that they wouldn't fall prey to right-wing and fascist projects. Um, so you needed to reconstruct national identity as a national popular identity. And to do so, you needed unity and unity under a political party. Um, but in the Latin American context, that unfortunately meant sacrificing differences and sacrificing multicultural diversity. And that's why for many of these national popular projects, integration was necessary. I mean, uh, taking the Mexican case, for instance, at the beginning of the 20th century, 80% of the population was rural. And many of these um, regions you know, did, not, uh, did not see themselves under a unified national identity. And the post-revolutionary project achieved to do that. And education was a main vehicle for that, to integrate the whole of the population from the north to the, to the south in a very multicultural country to unify them under the same idea that they were all part of the same national popular project. Um, but like I said, that that has um, uh, that leads eventually, like, like I think all nationalist projects in the end leads to exclusion because you tend to want to um, unify everybody under our same identity that you know, that 
um, people are very diverse and, and, and are never that homogeneous. And so um, that integration model became a pretext for authoritarian practices because they not only try to eliminate the diversity in the multicultural identities in Mexico, but they also try to identify uh, eliminate political dissidents, for instance. You know? So you were a traitor to the national popular if you did not abide by the national religious practices, the national political practices, and if you dissented at the national sexual, um, uh, heterogeneous, uh, sorry, um, heteronormative practices, no? Um, so if you did not abide by that, that construction of national identity, then you were a traitor. So decades after the Lázaro Cárdenas government, that's what you have. No? persecution for anybody that did not fall within those conservative parameters of national identity. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just trying to explain why integration is originally an important component of the national popular, but obviously uh, integration is very problematic when you think about a democratic nation, a uh, democratic and multinational, multi and pluricultural pluricultural um, nation and project. So how could we apply um, Gramsci to that? I, I don't think Gramsci, uh, Gramsci's ideas were um, in favor of an integration that would eliminate difference. Um, on, on the contrary, I think um, his ideas were all about including those differences, but he never spoke about eliminating them. Um, but then, you know, he didn't he didn't um, elaborate those ideas much more because obviously his context wasn't such a multicultural and complex context like the Latin American context in that sense. No, in like having to deal with flurry ethnic states. Mm. So I think we. There is a possibility of achieving an ideal of a national popular without integration and incorporating a pluricultural ideal of a national popular. I think the Bolivian government under Evo Morales tried to achieve such a thing. Um, but you know, if, if you look at that case uh, in, in a very um, detailed way, you'll find that there was a lot of disappointment within indigenous groups um, under his government too. And it was because I think the government was always struggling with how do we give further rights or more rights to indigenous groups? How do we allow for autonomy without then um, uh, weakening the nation, especially in a context where right-wing efforts are always trying to break up that unity. Um, and then uh, thinking about the, the role that religion has had. Um, yes, uh, again, I think when Gramsci talked talk about religion, he didn't necessarily say, oh, it's an opium of the masses and, and it's bad. He didn't, uh, on the contrary, I think he talked about the importance that it has for popular sectors and why you have to understand that significance if if you want to um, truly communicate and empathize with uh, popular sector. Um, so trying to eliminate something that is so deeply ingrained and so important for people won't get you anywhere. Um, and I think in the examples that Fabrizio was, was mentioning in, in the case of the Sandinista revolution, and in the case of the movement of Sintiera, precisely those organizations found a way to incorporate uh, faith and people's, people's faith and beliefs into a political project and to, to consider the church in that case as an ally rather than as an enemy. But I think you have to see that case by case because uh, you know, the church, for example, in Chile was also was was always on the very conservative side and and 
favor the dictatorship, for instance. And so I think in, in different cases, you'll find uh, that the church as an institution can have a political stance one way or the other. And then there's, that's the church, and then there's the parishes and the individual communities and the individual parishes and the way that those individual parishes will abide by the institution uh, alignments or not. So to say, oh, religion works in favor, religion works against, that would be too simplistic. Uh, it depends on, on, the, on the different contexts and the different trajectory that, um, and, and role that religion has played in the different regions. It's kind of like what I was talking about with teachers. You know? they, can, they, they can have a very progressive role, they can have uh, a very uh, negative role. So, um, yeah, so the, it, 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 the answer is it depends on the case. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, these are really very deep topics and, and very complex as well. Um, I think this will be the final question de Bernardo, Bernarda Rodriguez. Um, ¿Cuál cree que, la, que sea la principal herencia e influencia del pensamiento de Gramsci en la vida política actual latinoamericana? Thank you. Yeah, and it's a good way to sum, sum up the presentation. Um, I think what Gramsci did for Marxism in general was to give uh, Marxist theory political concepts, uh, more nuanced political tools to interpret the state and to interpret political life, something that uh, Marxist theory had talked about but and, and had looked at the state, but only the state as an appendix to um, economic relations. Um, Gramsci puts the political at the forefront and, and allows us to also incorporate the political concepts and concepts to understand political relationships when looking at the contradictions in economic relations. And so in that sense, we can see the contradictions in political relationships as well. What has Gramsci done then for Latin American political theory? Um, I think it allowed Latin America, it, it gave Latin American political thought more tools to uh, adapt Marxism. Um, it's, he's just a, another great author uh, that, that speaks to the reality of, of Latin American political processes that you can easily apply to understand political reality. And, um, and I think, that, like I said, it's just, it's, he's, he's another great author that um, Latin Americans have been adapting for decades, just like Marx. Um, and so we find great examples of Latin American Marxists, uh, and, and just the same, we find great examples of Latin American Gramsci. Um, and, and I think today, you know, for, for uh, Latin America today, I, I, I might seem a bit antiquated with this, but uh, I, I do think we need to revisit what role the political party is having in, in our political lives, because um, I, I'm all for autonomous organizations and efforts and constructing democracy from the bottom up. But I, I am very grand scheme in the sense that I do think that there needs to be an organic integration of all those political efforts. Um, and by integration, I'm saying coming together, not, not invisibilizing the differences. Uh, so, so I think Gramsci is still relevant when um, we look at the importance that uh, the cultural has for the political, um, but that's in a very kind of 21st century or post postmodernist way of looking at Gramsci, which I think is important. But I would also go back to 
further back to, to the original um, importance that Gramsci had as a as a political militant and as a leader of a political party. And like I was saying, obviously, I don't think that the political parties are the same as they were at the beginning of the 20th century, but I do still think that we need to debate about forms of political organization and what broader forms of political organization are useful to us beyond the, the bottom up and the smaller horizontal autonomous um, forms of political organization. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berenice. Um, it's it's almost two hours since we started, so uh, I think we are uh, finishing on um, on a profound note. Uh, neither optimistic nor pessimistic on its own, but rather something uh, like a mental homework that uh, of all the thoughts that still need to be processed and. Uh, the reconfiguration in the in the current global scenario, um, the re and one of the things that we are trying to do from the Center for Mexican Studies at, at, in the United Kingdom is to have the presence of Latin America acknowledged you know, with with a greater um, let us say uh, stance with a greater stance within it, and I, I I'm sure that. Uh, your, your contribution and the contribution of the Colegio Estudios Latinoamericanos has been essential, as well as the, the, the presence of everyone here um, who we, uh, we are grateful for. And uh, we still have one more talk to go. Um, so uh, we will see you then. Uh, thank you very much for taking part in this and um, have a nice rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, Anna Elena. I just want to end with a Gramsci phrase, which is pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. <laughs> and uh, 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 pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So we're pessimistic with our intellect because the more you know, the more you realize how complicated things are. But you shouldn't eliminate the optimism in your, in your will to try and uh, contribute to social change. <laughs> Um, and, and I want to send a special thank you to uh, some of, I've identified some of um, my ex-students that have joined the chat today, so thank you very much.